Dr. Wayne Anderson, I'm from the Food Safety Authority of Maryland, and I've uh, got 15 minutes very quickly to give you a, almost a sound bite, I think, in that time scale of emerging risks and uh, how we spot emerging risks. So uh, I'm not going to waste my time talking about anything else. Let's go straight into what emerging risks are. When we're talking about food safety and we're talking about emerging risks, the European Food Safety Authority has looked at this and had the definitions of emerging risks. In the first case, you're talking about a new hazard, something that we don't know about, something that's causing people to be sick, but we're not quite sure what it is. And, of course, whenever you're talking about a risk, you can have a hazard, but you always have to have someone exposed, otherwise it's not a risk. That's kind of, there's always two dimensions, there's a, a hazard and an exposure. So, we have a significant exposure to a new hazard becomes an emerging risk. There's also the concept that you would have something, a hazard that we know about, some bacteria we know about, like say Campylobacter, um, but suddenly we have a new exposure caused by maybe someone eating new foodstuffs, or maybe uh, your population's getting a bit older, etc., and getting a bit more susceptible. So we've got this concept of having a known hazard, but then a significant increase in, re in exposure. And then finally, the obvious one is uh, that you've got the known hazard, a significant exposure, but an increased susceptibility. And I always think the last two, the yellow and the green ones, are almost mixed in with the two. So I, although this is what EFSA say, I, I could almost see it as being distilled down to the two things. But the interesting thing about this, and uh, when we talk to a lot of the industry, this doesn't consider fraud. In this, in this emerging risk. And at the moment, because of the horse meat scandal that we had a few years ago in 2013, um, a lot of industry are doing horizon scanning and they're doing a lot of work looking into the future, but very much focused on the food fraud issue rather than the emerging risk issue. So currently EFSA doesn't take into account food fraud. Food fraud is looked at by the European Commission. EFSA is looking at other things about emerging risks, nothing to do with deliberate risks, if you like, caused by people doing deliberate things to the food chain. So we have a European-wide system of emerging risks, which is coordinated by EFSA, and in their founding regulation, they, they basically uh, had um, the European mandate to look at emerging risks. So they've had to set up a whole system um, to, to find signals of emerging risks throughout Europe because we trade food so much around Europe that you couldn't have one country just doing it. You need to have a pan-European system. And this is what EFSA has been working on setting up. So just to put it into context, early, emerging risks versus early warnings. And they're very different things. We have a number of early warning systems, like the rapid alert system that we run in Europe, which allows member states to communicate about issues that they're finding in their countries about the movement of unsafe food between countries. And we have the InfoSAM, which is a World Health Organization version for the globe. And these are very different because in these cases, the hazards or the risks have already emerged. They're already there. You know? So, when we're talking about emerging risk systems, it's more gazing off into the distance rather than looking very close to us. And the question about how far do you actually look ahead, because the further you look ahead, the more likely you are to pick up things, signals of risk that aren't really going to happen, and you have to be able to decipher those. So, it's very different. And it all sounds very easy to do, but when you actually think about the range of threats that you're talking about, you know, there's, there's many of them. And actually, there's so much information out there on the web, in the scientific literature, that actually trying to sift all that and find out the patterns is very, very difficult to do. So what sounds easy isn't actually easy in practice. And EFSA is one of the organisations around the world who's kind of the first to try and do this on a pan-national scale. So it's very difficult for them, and they're trying a number of different things to work it out. Just to put an example of what we're talking about, give you six uh, drivers of emerging risk, things for you to think about. First off is climate change. We've all heard about climate change and uh, how it might affect us, but let's look at it in terms of food safety risks and what might happen. This is an example of what EFSA has done. It's uh, commissioned a model where it looked at the different predictions of climate change and how that might affect the uh, growth of moulds on, uh, on a wheat stock. Okay? And these moulds produce aflatoxin, which is uh, a genotoxic carcinogen, which we really don't want to take in a lot of, uh, a lot of food in that. We, we have to accept a certain amount, but we can't take in a lot. 
And the, the problem is, is as the climate changes, these threats become more risky. So in the current situation, you can see there, this is a scale of uh, um, the level of aflatoxin infection that they would predict given the climate. And you can see down there, a lot of the southern states around the Mediterranean are affected by this. But as we go into different scenarios, I'm not exactly sure of what years we're talking about, but we're probably talking 20 years, 40 years into the future. When you look at the predictions of climate change, you'll see there's far more red activity in these areas and the slight moving of the boundaries into other countries. And as you get into much further, you're, you're talking about the effects of aflatoxin in a lot of the stock, wheat stock, across the whole of continental Europe. We're going to be safe enough at this stage. But ultimately, what we're trying to say to you is that if we can predict ahead of time there's going to be this problem, then we'll have the monitoring systems in place to be able to ensure that we're not exposed in the population too. And these are the sort of things we want to do when we're looking at emerging risks. So climate change is a big one. Changing food consumption behaviour is also a driver of emerging risk. Um, you know, Irish stew, yeah, that's a nice traditional food in Ireland, but now we have traditional Irish pizzas as well and all sorts of things. And as we get uh, changes in population, as we're taking in a more, uh, a, more, a more global population into Ireland, these changes happen faster, you know, we have all sorts of restaurants. You only have to go down Parnell Street these days to see all the different types of nationality and restaurants we have, and they're all importing food from different parts of the world, etc. So, Changing food consumption behaviours can expose a population to a risk that they weren't initially exposed to, and that falls into the hazard of an emerging risk. Okay? Globalisation of the food chain, somewhat linked to the last one, um, is always going to be a problem. There's a great infographic you can click into at this link, which basically allows you to click on the different parts of the food in this bowl, and it tells you where the ingredients came from. And it's kind of interesting to do. If you look at the croutons, just a screen grab there, you'll see they can come from all of these different countries. So what do you think is a local salad? By the time you've finished, is anything but a local salad? And you know yourselves, you walk into Tesco's or any of the big retailers, and you can get any kind of produce at any time of the year. Seasonality doesn't even come into it. So this kind of movement of food around the, around the globe is going to cause risks coming to us because we're now going to be exposed to risks in one country where we would have looked in the newspapers and maybe said, oh, that's a problem in India. And now within three days, it's now a problem in Ireland. You know, so we have to take this into account. Environmental contamination is going to be a big one as we go into the future. We have natural contamination like the uh, volcanoes. These things are throwing out lots of things like fluorides and lots of uh, problems and hazards. These settle into the environment. These affect the crops we grow. We've got nuclear incidents like the one in Japan we had with the earthquakes. And we have industrial increase. Here's a graph of uh, China, for instance, the uh, change in industrial production. Uh, and you can just see China there, the rest of the world is kind of sitting here, EU, US, and Japan. China's going hmm, straight off the market. And that's causing pressures on their environment, because what we tend to find in all industrialized situations is the, the industrialization increases and the environmental laws catch up with it eventually. But in that time, you're pumping a lot of stuff into the environment, into the air, into the water, into the soil, into the environment that basically get into your foodstuffs. So this is always a risk. And if we're trading a lot more with China, we're also exposed to these risks. And that's, that's the reality. Is once you've got a problem around the world, you get it everywhere around the world. New technologies, you might think, is a strange one, but we have to look at these. Here's an example. This is 3D printing. You like this one? You like this sort of stuff? You know, in TNO, they're doing lots of work now on printing food. I mean, if I'd have said to you a few, you know, maybe 10 to 20 years ago, oh, you know, you can have that picture of Superman on top of your cake of your, your kid at your at, at his party, you'd have gone, yeah, right. Uh, you can imagine someone sticking bits of uh, icing around to get Superman. But now we're inkjet printing that onto the top of cakes. That's accepted. Why not construct the cake? You know, these guys now are printing food from, from ground up using precursors. Here you've just got a very simple example where they're taking a, a carrot puree and printing it into a carrot. You know, why? Well, because they can, but also for people who may not be able to actually eat food, you know, they've got problems with digestion, at least they get something that actually looks appealing as opposed to a mush. 
you know, so there are applications of these. With confectionery now, they can fit all sorts of very pretty patterns. This brings with it hazards. I mean, how do, you do, how do you hygienically design bright, for instance? How do you hygienically design a 3D printer? It would be very difficult. This will bring hazards with it. So new technologies, nanotechnology, synthetic biology, all of these things bring new hazards into our future. Our population is changing, our demographics are changing. We're looking at 20, 20, 50 million new uh, mouths to feed every year. This is going to put pressure. As you get older, you get more susceptible to uh, bacteria, so effectively you have potential problems there. So as we get an aging population, we get, an age, we get more potential hazards to things we already know about, listeria, salmonella, campylobacter. The other thing as well is that, you know, you look at water scarcity as an issue, and this again is linked to global uh, climate change as well. You know, it, this is the WHO FAO um, report, and they're saying by two, 2025, we'll have 1.8 billion people will be living in countries with absolute water scarcity. What does that mean? Well, of course, it's not very good for the people living in the countries. But the other thing is, is that when they're trying to grow produce to sell to other countries, they're going to be using water that's potentially contaminated. They're going to have to rely on less clean water supplies. So that brings potential problems to us. So all of these things you can imagine, when you start putting your brain to it, you imagine they're all interlinked, and this can all affect our food supply. The job of EFSA, the job of our member states, the job of the Food Safety Authority is to try and anticipate these, try and identify them and anticipate them. So, all systems may not work. At least when we were looking for the needle in the haystack, we knew what the needle looked like. But nowadays, we have a haystack and we don't even know what the needle looks like. And so we have to build up systems that can identify what the needle is. And EFSA did a, did a piece of work, and I'm not going to dwell on this because of time, but effectively they, they did a two-year study where they tried to look at the web and all sorts of systems, trying to pick out uh, signals, as we call them, of, of emerging risks, things that, you, that might come down the track at us. And over that period, they picked up 2,200 issues, and uh, when they put them through expert opinion, they ended up with 250 potential emerging risks. So you can see this kind of has, a, has a nasty habit of starting out here, coming to here, but it's still got a huge number of problems that you, you have to decide which one's going to hit you. And to do that, the, the, the issue they thought originally was let, let's all get all the data together and let's data mine it. All very well and good, but as you say, too many things, too many problems. So the answer is data, but the answer is quality data. And obviously getting all the data in and getting quality data out is what we're trying to achieve, and that's very, very difficult. So the EFSA system they currently have sitting in place now is that they have these automated data systems, plus they have the good old human beings on their panels, the scientists on their, their contact groups and the EFSA staff, all feeding in potential issues. And these are filtered through a panel of EFSA staff who kind of look at them and say, yeah, is that possibly a risk or not? Do we need to get more information? And when they get to the stage of saying, yes, this is an emerging issue, they'll, they'll put in briefing papers together and they'll feed them through a couple of networks. The first one is the one I'm sit on in EFSA, which is Member States Emerging Risk Network, which is where all the member states sit around and we discuss these issues. We can also feed in these emerging issues from our own tracking systems and also push out the information to member states. There's a similar one for the food industry where they have a stakeholder group composed of food industry people who do exactly the same thing. When we tossed it all around a bit, added extra information to it, these go through to uh, briefing notes into the standing working group, which is made up of all of the chairs and vice chairs of the different scientific panels in EFSA. And they basically decide whether it's an emerging risk or not, if they have to do more work, whether they can do a risk assessment, is there enough information. And this is the system we're currently working at in, uh, in, in Europe. And this is our little bit of it here in this, sec in this section. So every year they do an outputs report, and this is available on the web of the sort of things we're talking about. And then uh, there you can find tables of the issues that have been discussed by which group and what the follow-up was and you'll see 3D printing here as one of the examples and you can get access to that so you can look at this sort of stuff if you're interested. In Ireland then we've got this bit of system set up quite nicely. We've got interactions between the Food Safety Authority as the hub of this system and certain of the agencies that we work with, Department of Agriculture and Marine. The other question is really what do we do with the, in terms of the food industry, how do we communicate it to the food industry, how do we communicate with other agencies. One of the big problems with this is that EFSA like to keep this work confidential, we have to sign confidential agreements with them. 
Why? Because obviously what they don't want is to create a scare. <laughs> you know, so, so, so a lot of the stuff we're talking about is potential, but sometimes the media can make some potential unreal. So what we're trying to do is keep this really at an evaluation stage. So it gets hard to do this, but somehow what my job is over the next sort of 12 months or so is to work out how we do this and nationally how we get a system together, how we can feed more meaningfully into EFSA and feed the information out of EFSA into the food industry. And that's what I'll be talking to people about. And that's it. How's that for Tom? <laughs>